the commission members. So, Commissioner Felt? Here. Commissioner Fern? Here. Commissioner Gordon? Here. Commissioner Hull? Commissioner Nahidi? Here. Commissioner Preston? Here. Commissioner Parsons? Here. Commissioner Ack Council Member Ackerman? Commissioner Trudeau? Here. Commissioner Dolan? Here. Commissioner Palumbo? Sergeant Bell Clock? Here. Commissioner Cooper? Here. Commissioner Lazarus? Here. We'll come back to Commissioner Hull. Here. Thank you. And we have a quorum. Great. One other announcement, sorry, Linda Dan, meant to add this on, is that we do have still one vacant position with the commission. We announced uh, at the last meeting in April that Commissioner Preston is stepping off of the commission and that uh, another um, representative has been identified, but we also have Commissioner Stoltz, whose position has not yet been filled. So if there are any members of the public that are interested in serving on the Transportation Commission, there is a link to apply for the commission on the city webpage. Um, if you go to a2gov.org and the, uh, click on Democracy tab, there's a Boards and Commissions link that takes you to Legistar. You can find uh, Transportation Commission and then apply there. So um, welcome those applications. And then one last Addition to the roll call, Councilmember Ackerman. Here. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Are there any additions or uh, corrections, changes to the agenda? Then I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Okay. And seconded. Second. All right. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Now we have a chance for a public comment, and that's three minutes apiece. So you get to sign in and then speak. And Kayla's keeping track of the time as well. Oh, good evening. My name is Clark Chernetsky. And uh, a couple items. One is uh, in your packet or your information before the meeting, there was some remarks about the core. Uh, crosswalk uh, ordinance and I'm fi strongly in favor of keeping the ordinance pretty much as is. I think that it is uh, a prudent thing and it's common courtesy that if somebody's about to cross the street, wants to cross the street, the car should stop. Shouldn't have to put yourself or others if you're pushing a baby buggy, for example, at risk by stepping out into the street in order to get the cars to stop. Also, I live uh, on just on Nixon Road by Plymouth Road, so I go on Plymouth Road a lot. And the rectangular flashers work. It took a little while for people to get used to them, but uh, they're pretty much obeyed. I haven't seen very many cases where people have not uh, gone with that. I remember the tragedy back about, uh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago where two young women were killed trying to across uh, Plymouth Road in one accident, hit by a pickup truck uh, after they were leaving the mosque. Uh, I'm also, I'm generally in favor of sidewalk extensions. I know you've got this one up before you tonight. I don't know the specifics of this particular one, but uh, I'm on a couple committees, one for AATA and the other for the smart bus system, having to do with services for seniors and people with disabilities. And the problem we run into a lot is the difficulty of uh, accessing bus stops. And so uh, there's still some areas around Ann Arbor that uh, so where the sidewalk should be extended. I'm entirely in favor of that. Uh, you also uh, recently have looked at uh, speeding and I was involved in uh, Blewett uh, speed bumps or speed humps there. And I heard something interesting on the BBC recently, something they were trying in England, and that was to have local communities uh, have radar guns and they would write letters to people that were speeding. Uh, if you get a chance to go to the BBC website and find out something about that, it was an interesting idea. 
also you mentioned in your roll call, Carmen Poambo. He's, I saw him the other night and he's retiring soon from SEMCOG. I think he's been at SEMCOG ever since there was a SEMCOG. And I, I wish him well. And I assume you'll be getting a new member here for that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? All right, then public commentary is closed. Thanks for that. Um, we have minutes to approve. Hope you've all read them. Any additions or corrections to the minutes? Then I'll take a motion to approve. I move to approve the minutes. All right, seconded by. Second. Okay, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, great. Um, and then we have an item that is uh, a little bit delayed, and that's entirely my fault um, for procrastinating, but these are the additional comments that were asked for to go with the, uh, the vote of the commission in favor of uh, keeping the sidewalk ordinance as is. Um, and uh, we would like to forward this on to the city council. And so we just need a motion um, to forward this to city council as the second part of that recommendation. And then we can discuss it if you'd like after the motion and second. Or if you'd like to discuss it ahead of time, I'm willing to be flexible. Um, but I, it doesn't matter to me whether it's first or second. Go ahead. <laughs> well, the minor thing that doesn't really matter is the comments include. It would be nice if they were just punctuated the same. But the co um, con content related item is it, it came up um, in a discussion online. People were in disagreement as to the meaning of the ordinance. And um, maybe the city can weigh in on the actual. Um, correct interpretation. It says, um, pedestrian within a crosswalk when the pedestrian is on the half of the roadway on which the vehicle is traveling, or when the pedestrian is approaching so closely from the opposite half as to be in danger. So I, I interpret that, and I think maybe other drivers would interpret that to mean I don't have to stop unless they're in my lane or at least if it's four lanes in my two lanes. But other people interpret it to mean if they're standing on either curb or in the crosswalk on either side, you should stop. And I think the general understanding of people is that it matters not which side they're on. You're supposed to stop, and it certainly makes it easier to cross if they stop, even if you're not on that side of the direction they're traveling. But the actual ordinance implies to me that it doesn't matter unless they're on your side. So I'm actually confused as to what the actual rule is, and I wonder if we would be able to recommend a slight modification to be in line with what it is intended to be. Um, Process-wise, I guess I'd like uh, either Commissioner Eli or, or Cook to comment on that and then if we need to take this up on another time as uh, a modification then okay. we can do that but just can you just offer a little bit of clarity as to what yeah, so I apologize I don't have a copy of the ordinance with me uh, my understanding for a multi-lane facility so three four or more uh, that the center line is operable meaning that if it's a less than three lane roadway, so any two lane roadway, if a pedestrian is in the crosswalk or at the curb line, that constitutes the stop condition. On a multi-lane facility, it is approaching the center line of the roadway as has been described. So it does, I believe, again, without the language, I can't recite it specifically, but it, it is materially different for a multi-lane facility uh, than it is for a two-lane road, something like Liberty, for example. 
where you don't have a center turn lane, it's a two lane road with a crosswalk. If there's a pedestrian, the operating rule is stop. Regardless of whether it's on your half of the, the pedestrian is on the curb or in the crosswalk on your side of the street. On multi-lane roads, because there's such a great distance between uh, where the curb line is on the alternate side and that a pedestrian has 20, 25 feet till they get to the center line, it allows for uh, the privilege, if you will, of drivers to continue until the pedestrian gets to the point where the language is approaching that center line. So it's, again, a multi-lane situation. Uh, and, and I will look for the language. I can probably find it while the meeting's still going on to confirm precisely what it says, but that's my general understanding. Okay. So I'd rather not debate that now. Right. Um, but if you feel that we need to, um, at a later date, modify our recommendation to city council, then that can come back. Or we can put in a bullet point that there's confusion regarding the actual language of the ordinance as written in that regard that should be followed up on, or if that is not what should go to council and it should be decided here and then put forward. Um, then that's a possibility. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about opening that can of worms <laughs> without preparation and without everybody having the, the ordinance in front of them, et cetera. So, um, well, I, I just think it's inappropriate to say we love the ordinance, just increase education um, when it actually is quite confusing. And we didn't realize that at the time we had the original meetings, the original discussion we didn't actually read the text and discuss that issue. Okay. Um, we can delay this recommendation to um, council at this point if we want to another month so that we can uh, further examine that question. Is it tenable to recommend going forward and then have a separate issue on a future meeting agenda to yes. address that issue? Yes. I think that would be satisfactory to me. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, we can do that. You, you may want to have a city attorney representative here. They're the, the legal experts and, and they approve the ordinance uh, with the council vote. So um, I think Ariane Slay does our traffic um, cases now. She's a new city, assistant city attorney. Yeah, so we can put that as an agenda item for Kayla to look at for the, and I to look at for the future. You won't be here, but we, That's you're- That's okay, I have a very competent individual that I expect will be sitting here. <laughs> right, and you can also address <laughs> us. <laughs> okay, so is there a motion to um, uh, bring this to city council as the second part of our recommendations? I saw Zachary, your motion. I will move. Okay, seconded by. I'll second. Okay. Is there further discussion? And I do apologize that this is late. Okay, then all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, so we have two actions from that item. Um, now, for information discussion, we have the Fuller Road sidewalk near Huron High School. Um, and to start with, we have a presentation. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Slazuski. I'm an engineer in the uh, city's engineering group. Um, I'm here to talk about the, the blue line on the, on the maps that the commissioners may have seen. It's, it's on, the, on the TV screen behind you. Some of you may have the, the hard copy. Um, the blue line is the, what we're calling the Fuller Road sidewalk extension. And what I'd like to do is give you a, a, a b brief background on, on what's happened and also talk a little bit, bit about where we're going from here. Um, just many of you are very familiar with the area, but for anybody who's not referring to the map, um, the area where the 
baseball fields and football fields are. That's the, the Huron High School athletic campus, the high school being just immediately um, above that. Um, the road on the right, the boulevard, is, is Huron Parkway. Um, down at the lower right-hand corner, the Huron Parkway Fuller Road intersection. And then going up on, on Fuller Road, um, you can see the driveway or the, the road going into uh, Gala Park there. And then the, the, the blue line is, is the, the, the concept location for the uh, Fuller Road sidewalk extension. Um, you, you can see very clearly on, on the drawing um, or on, on the map where the existing crosswalk is for the, for the students that would be coming up from the park to be able to cross Fuller Road. Um, then extending, uh, you know, looking off to the left, that blue line crossing uh, Fuller Road is, I'll be talking about that in a few minutes, is, is where a real, where I talk about the relocated crosswalk, that's where that would be. And then continuing up Fuller Road, um, as you get to the very upper left-hand corner of, of that map, you can see the driveway going into the high school and also a little bit to the right of the driveway, you see there's a parking lot and then there's that, that's the pedestrian path, the sidewalk that leads up into the high school. So that's just kind of an orientation for anybody who may not be familiar um, with, with the area. Um, the city conducted a road safety audit of this area and I'm specifically now talking about the area of that existing crosswalk going from the park area across Fuller. And uh, coming out of that road safety audit were some recommendations for some, uh, I'd say, immediate actions that, that could take place. And those, um, I, I believe, have all been implemented, making sure that the crosswalk is clearly marked, um, lights have been installed, um, you know, overhead lighting, as well as the pedestrian activated warning, uh, warning signals um, have all been installed. Um, in that road safety audit, there is also a longer term recommendation, and that recommendation was to relocate that crosswalk from its current location um, further to the west. Uh, just to kind of estimate the distance from the existing crosswalk to where that blue line is about 400 feet. Um, one of the, some of the reasons for moving that crosswalk further to the west, uh, one is that the traffic um, on Fuller Road at times stopping for the signal at Huron Parkway is queuing up past the crosswalk location. So it would move the existing crosswalk location. So it'd move the crosswalk to an area where it's not being impacted by the, the traffic queuing. Um, also, where the crosswalk is right now, there are more lanes of traffic as, as uh, eastbound Fuller widens out um, approaching uh, Huron Parkway. Um, moving it to the west, there are just a two lanes, one eastbound, one westbound lane. There is a, a center lane marked in that area. And by relocating to that new area, it gives us the opportunity to put a pedestrian island in there um, to construct you know, a, a pedestrian refuge um, in the center of the road. So the, the, the queuing, the multiple lanes and the opportunity to install a pedestrian island were three of the reasons for, for moving that crosswalk to the west um, to, to the you know, new proposed location. Um, we did some very basic preliminary work where that blue line is located, you know, looking at uh, the survey of the land out there. Um, to basically do you know, just a very preliminary engineering evaluation to determine it's, it's feasible to construct um, sidewalk in that location. Um, with that, the information that we had, the city applied for a safety grant to the Department of Transportation um, and, and did receive the grant um, that will substantially fund the construction um, of the sidewalk and also of the relocated crossing. 
So where we're at right now in the process is really seeking input from the public on the concept that we have to extend the sidewalk on Fuller Road and to relocate that crossing. Uh, we met with the school uh, TSC, the Transportation Safety Committee, um, at, the, uh, at their last meeting in April um, to really present this information and get feedback from them. Um, and then we will be, now we will be holding a public information meeting at Huron High School on May 29th, that's the Tuesday after uh, Memorial Day, uh, 6.30 in the evening. The school is, is really trying to get the word out there to get people to participate, get the public to, uh, to come to that meeting. Um, so that's certainly one of the reasons that we're here um, before you is to seek your input, questions, comments on the idea for the sidewalk extension and the relocated crossing. Um, some of the things, I'll just point out, some of the things that, that we've heard, um, so, some ideas. Um, make sure that the sidewalk gets extended to the park entrance. Um, you see the blue line doesn't stop at the crosswalk, but does go up to the park entrance. There is path on the um, east side of the park entrance, but the, where we're talking about right now is currently a gap right now. So we would make sure that that gets connected. Uh, make sure that the width of the pathway, it's not a standard five foot sidewalk, make sure it's, uh, you know, it, it matches the area that we're in, matches the width of the sidewalks, like an eight foot or 10 foot wide pathway there. Um, use geometrics to divert people away from the current crossing. What, what that idea is, the, the, you know, the pathway for, imagine a student coming out of uh, Gallup Park is on the pathway. Um, they just stay straight on the path and, and they cross here on our cross uh, Fuller Road there. Um, they're talking about, we're talking about, you know, revising the geometric so it will naturally lead the students away from that old crossing that would be gone toward the, toward the new crosswalk. Um, another idea was, you know, use something to physically obstruct the, the old crossing so that not only is the path aligned to turn you, but there's, you know, something in the way that you're not, if you're not paying attention, you're not just gonna keep walking um, straight across Fuller Road. Um, also make sure that any existing signs that there was a crosswalk there um, be completely obliterated, you know, remove the paint markings, um, there's curb ramps at those locations. Make sure full curb is installed. Make sure, you know, grass is put down there that there's, you know, no concrete left. So there's nothing to visually indicate to a student that they should continue to be crossing at that location. Um, uh, one, one of the ideas, I, I wrote it down as an idea, a suggestion is something that we had followed up on is uh, work with the school. I know Liz Margolis was not able to make it this evening, but met with Liz. Um, what are the desired destinations for students on the Huron campus? Um, you're moving that crosswalk. Um, was there a reason where students needed to cross where it was and by, by moving it to the west, they will still need to you know, backtrack or anything like that? And the answer was really no. They're, the desired location for the students to get to is the school. The access point to the school is that sidewalk that's further to the west on Fuller. So by moving the students to a crosswalk further to the west, they'll be able to cross and continue on their way um, to the access into the school. Um, another idea or thought that we had that we'd certainly cover is make sure that the lighting, there's lighting that's, that's been installed at the current crosswalk location. Make sure that all of the lighting gets moved, obviously, the RRFB signals, the, the activated warning signals. Make sure all of those items get moved also. So those are some of the things that we've heard so, so far. Um, moving forward um, on the project, this, this isn't something that we're talking about constructing next month or anything like that. The schedule uh, for, for this to be constructed would not be until the 2019, in the summer of 2019, when, when the students are out. Um, so at the point we're at right now, 
we would this summer just be requesting council authorization to begin the design on the project. Um, and during the design um, on sidewalk gap projects, there's, uh, there are multiple opportunities where we come back to council um, also um, during that process. So that's kind of a, just a very brief summary of where we are, how we got there, and some, some you know, brief look on where we may be going looking forward. Um, Cynthia, I don't know, do, Cynthia, do you have? Cynthia, do you have anything else you want to? Okay. Um, I turn it over to the commissioners for any questions, input, suggestions that you have. Questions and comments? Yeah. Um, just a point of, clar of clarification. Uh, you had mentioned one of the comments was about keeping the same sidewalk uh, width that's there now. I, I was a little confused. Is, is the sidewalk that's there now, or what is the configuration, what is the width? Um, I think it varies. I think it's eight, eight, ten feet. I think there's some six foot sidewalk too. I think it just varies. So the plan is to try and match that minimum six feet. Oh, no. why, why do they? I would say eight feet would okay. be a desired. Um, we'll see. Given the location, the constraint of the right of way, I mean, that those that comes into the hard design. How wide can you reasonably make it? Ten feet would be a very wide path to be able to put in. That would be desirable. Um, the constraints out there might not allow us to do that. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood what the plan was for. Stephanie. So he mentioned at the end of that list, these are the things that people have mentioned to us. Are we to understand that those are things the city is amenable to doing? That the things mentioned are the things in the current plan because some of these things weren't in the original plan and and so I was wanting to know if the list of improvements were things the city was actually planning on doing or just a list of things people have mentioned the, the, uh, many of these are things that would be incorporated yes yes are, are there ones you expect not to be incorporated um, I can't say that there are no okay and, and I assume the document would be updated because this is before the RRFB was installed, the document that was shared with us, and before the speed zone signs were installed. Um, do you mean the, the road safety audit document? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. No, because that is a summary record of what happened. Okay. That is not a working document. That is just oh. a, a summary of what happened when we conducted the RSA. So there would be another version sent to people eventually of what we are actually planning on doing? Another version of the RSA? Uh, I don't. Well, it doesn't no, have to be an be RSA, developed. but it would be. Right. We would be developing plans. Right, right, like yes, the, the proposal the, the that people would. Yeah. We, if authorized, we would develop construction plans, engineering plans. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, okay. that would be the next step. Uh, yeah, a couple of things, and uh, maybe we can have a little bit of a dialogue. I, I think I have a, just a couple uh, things to point out. Um, one being that, that <clears throat> just a clarification, the, the current crosswalk really only has two lanes of traffic. It's not multiple lanes there, because the left-hand turn lane goes away, and the, the right-hand lane is actually not a lane. People are illegally using it as a lane. Is that correct? <laughs> I don't disagree with that statement. Um, I guess part of what you have to consider is that it's the additional width, right? So you do have that additional width there. And then part of what the road safety audit team was very concerned about as they were going through their process was the number of conflict points at that location because you do have that additional width and we have installed some gateway elements to help with that. But when the gateway elements are out, then you can still have those multiple conflict points in that particular location. Plus, you have the conflict points with the turning movements that you don't have at a location to the west. Okay. And then um, it, it's wider, but there's a painted curb line, right, that could go in at the current, that could go in as cement at a curb bump out on the existing pad that's, that's painted, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's actually a narrower crossing. Now, granted, you have the, the chance for a median further down. 
Um, but it, so I, I just want to clarify, it's not multiple lanes necessarily. I understand the turning movement, certainly, um, aspect. Um, my concern here is, and I'm glad to hear that there's potential for obstructions for people uh, who want to go straight. Uh, as I was riding my bicycle here, I was just counting the number of people who other people would say are jaywalking, I would say are crossing where it's most convenient for them. Uh, and I think that we need to be designing spaces so that pedestrians can get across the street where it's most desirable for them to get across the street, not necessarily uh, where uh, we would like them to cross. So I'd, I'd be very curious to hear more why students use that place. Uh, one, uh, bicyclists also use that quite a bit. That's a connector from North Campus as well as further points uh, west to the uh, border to border trail. Right, so uh, if we're gonna do the sidewalk extension, it absolutely needs to be at least eight and more like 10 with the, the volume of uh, traffic there. Uh, the other concern is if we're talking eight or 10 feet, how close to the car through lane do you think that sidewalk might need to be that's adjacent to it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't even wanna venture a guess at this. So then the last thing, sorry, I keep saying so much. Um, in the, in the uh, report, there was um, the many observations and many decisions in a short space that you mentioned, right? There's too many things going on. I, I think that's only a problem because it's 40 miles an hour as a speed limit. There's far more things going on in downtown than, than these movements, right? So it's at that speed that it's a problem, which lends the question, there's a park here, there's schools here, there's kids crossing the street, why is this still going as a 40 mile an hour? We're just moving the crosswalk down. And in fact, we're moving it to a place where cars traveling west will be traveling faster than after they've just made their turning movements, which connects, of course, to the Vision Zero discussion that I hope we're gonna have later, so that we're talking about the most vulnerable users. And 40 miles an hour, as we know, it's a 90% chance somebody's gonna die. 90%. I, 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 I just caution uh, us to, to think cl clearly and, and make sure this is the right decision in making that, that move. Thanks. Um, addressing the, the conflict points, the conflict points are going to be there regardless of the speed. Is speed reduction has been put in place for school crossing times, so those are out there right now. But more importantly, context really drives a speed that a motorist chooses. So when you have a very rural context, which this section of roadway currently is, has a more rural feel to it, motors are going to choose a higher speed. Getting more of those urban design elements into the corridor is going to help drive that lower speed choice. And, you know, the. The conflict points, I, I can't unstress the conflict points enough because that was a very, very big concern for the road safety audit team. And I keep referring to them as the road safety audit team because I was the facilitator on this particular project. I was not a team member. So the road safety audit team was very, very concerned about those conflict points and, um, and the cues. The frequency with which cues from the traffic signal are queuing past this signal, or past this this location, and you know you've got people trying to walk between cars, which is not a good scenario. And when you look at the ultimate destinations and how we need to move people to get there, there is not a direct desire line on the north side of this crossing. They still have to travel west to be able to go north because you have fences and buildings and stadium style seating and all of that stuff that's in, in between those two points. So there isn't a way to, to hit that diagonal. You have to move, you have to travel west before you can go north. So uh, just a quick follow up. Uh, is it true that when drivers perceive more conflict points that they tend to slow down? I mean, 
could we just introduce more of those urban treatments to this particular location where it looks like people have chosen to cross? I mean, this went in specifically because students were crossing here and pedestrians were crossing here and cyclists are using this space. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'd, I'd like others to chime in. Sorry, sorry it took so much time. Other, oh, yes, sir. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I, I can't imagine, I certainly hear the issues of queuing. I don't want people trying to cross. People are often most distracted when they're stopped at an intersection. It's when people check their phones, unfortunately. And then also just the line of sight issues for people crossing. Um, the, I can't imagine this is the only pedestrian crosswalk where cars and intersections start to queue past the crosswalk. <coughs> are there opportunities to, are there, how can we manage cars queuing in long lines where pedestrians wanna cross? Are there opportunities to create areas, you know, part the Red Sea of cars and, and, and allow people to continue using crosswalks where there may be a lot of backed up traffic? Well, that's really dependent on the amount of pedestrian activity. Mm -hmm. If you have a pedestrian crossing that has a high amount of pedestrian activity and you start to meet warrants for higher levels of control of the crossing, then you can create stop conditions that are signalized and, and those sorts of things. You know, this is an area where you don't have that steady stream of crossing all the time. And the crossings that we have are not meeting signal warrant levels. Um, so in that case, what you're looking for is to find a place where you can better put the pedestrian in front of the driver's eyes so that they are seeing them. Okay. And I mean, you know, we did very seriously take into consideration how people are moving through this corridor and where their desired locations are and whether or not, you know, you don't ever want to move a crosswalk to some place where people aren't going to be using it. And based on the observations of the pedestrian behavior out here on this corridor, it, it, we are comfortable with the fact that they will still continue to use this crossing because of how they need to get to where they're going. Okay, understood. Um, last very quick question. Uh, the north, the curb cut that looks like it leads to a gravel road towards the athletic facilities, is that used heavily? What is that curb cut? It's, an, uh, so we asked Liz Margolis that and what Liz said was that it's more of a a maintenance access for them. It does get used a little bit when there's a baseball or a softball game. People tend to park on the grass there. Um, but other than that, it's it's not a regular use. Okay. And does it present an active danger to pedestrians on the north side as they're at this time continuing down towards the crosswalk that exists today? Just seems like a unnecessary. It, well, it is a driveway. Um, like other driveways, it does present a conflict point. Um, but it's, I mean, it's where there are people who are going in to mow the grass and take care of maintenance at the stadium and those sorts of things mm -hmm. are generally the people who are using it. And they're there in the middle of the day, not necessarily okay. at school travel time. Unless there's a football or baseball game, or is that, do we not see high pedestrian activity at 5, 6 p.m. when those games happen, 7 p.m.? What I've noticed is that their games tend to start, their baseball and softball games tend to start a little bit earlier in the day. All right. Um, but it is a driveway, like other driveways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments, questions?
Anything else you'd like from us? No. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your explanation. Very helpful. All right, so we're going to move on to pavement asset management. Thank you very much. Um, I, you guys have, I think, all met me before. I'm Nick Hutchinson. I'm the city engineer. Um, and with me is Deb Gosselin, who I think may have presented once here before on the CIP. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working on this uh, for a couple of years now, um, our pavement asset management program, and that's what we'd like to share with you this evening. We're going to kind of go back and forth in this presentation here, um, take turns between the two of us, um, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So. Deb's going to take the lead, and then I'll jump in in a minute. Thanks, Nick. So this is going to be kind of a high-level view, given our time frame. Uh, back, I think it was probably fall of 14, um, City Council identified Fix Our Roads as one of their high-priority goals, and that became a public services area project. And they also set up a couple of indicators as, as we made our plan, how would we know whether we're successful when we start to implement it. So early on, they established that a couple of the indicators that we'll be talking about a little later in the presentation is what are your system-wide pavement condition ratings and how many miles of roadway are you treating every year? Because obviously to get better, most of those things have to happen. So in approaching setting up an asset management plan, we're not by any means going to go into great detail on this 10-step approach uh, that you see, but I am going to highlight a couple of these steps in it as we go through here. Um, this is a process that actually the EPA uh, came up with to approach any kind of asset management. It doesn't have to just be roads. It could be uh, actually we're following it as we're developing sanitary and stormwater asset management plans, but we will hit on sort of the highlights of how we put this together. So in some of the particular steps we're going to highlight are step one, that you have to know what you have by having an inventory. Uh, the second step, that you have to know the condition you're starting from. And then we're going to skip ahead to talking a little bit about the target level of service. What are you shooting for? And then really step six through 10 all lead to producing an actual plan for how do you spend your money to try and advance toward that chosen level of service. So the first thing we did back in 2014 is take a look at what is our street inventory? How many miles of road, what type of roads do we need to take care of and plan for? So we have roughly 283 miles of asphalt roads. In other communities, have other a lot heavier to concrete. We have almost everything asphalt. Uh, we have a little bit of brick in the Carytown area, and you see uh, fifth being worked on right now. That will go back in brick, by the way. Uh, and it surprises a lot of people to know that as public roads we're talking about here, there are private roads that we do not take care of, but we have roughly 12 miles of gravel roads and then about four and a half miles of concrete roads. So altogether, we're managing about 300 miles of road, and those are the ones that we receive Act 51 or what we commonly call gas tax money uh, as one of the means of taking care of. Those are also the roads that our local street millage can be spent on. And of those, about 95 miles are classified as major streets and about 188, uh, excuse me, in total about 99 as major and about 200 are local. So we will go back to the point that roughly two thirds of our streets are locals as we go along. So then we had to choose a method. How are we going to rate the condition of our streets? 
So um, the highway department, MDOT, is very married to the rating system called PASER. I'm sure many of you here are familiar with it. That's just short for Pavement Surface Evaluation and Rating System. So again, we aren't gonna go into details about the PASER rating scale, but it's one to 10 and you don't wanna be a one. <laughs> so one is the end of the scale you don't uh, shoot for. So uh, sometimes scales are upside down, but this one's pretty straightforward. Higher is a better rating than a lower rating. So rating efforts to date, when we started out in 2014, for the first time, the city hired a consultant uh, named Transmap in this case to rate all of our streets at once. Historically, the ratings had been done by public works, often using uh, summer interns, and roughly if we, about the best we hit was doing about 20% a year. So that meant you never had a point in time when you knew the condition of your whole system. And when you're creating models, having that ability is very important. So we rated them for the first time in 17. Uh, then uh, Nick and I made some presentation to council saying, here's our starting point. And then the consultants came back last summer and rated them for a second time. So we were shooting for a three year uh, interval. And we will talk about the results of that as we go along. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick for a bit. So um, it's all well and good to say we wanna make the condition of our pavements, uh, um, condition of our roads better, but uh, we need to define exactly what that means by making our roads better. So we need to set a target level of service. Um, we, you know, af after I'm doing this a little bit backwards and that we started uh, playing with the model to try to figure out what made sense. Um, ultimately, in much internal discussions, what we came down with was setting a goal for 80% of our roads to by 2025 to be a seven, which is good or better. Um, that is a very ambitious goal. Um, and we'll see um, if we can make that. Um, by comparison, you can see at the bottom of that slide our uh, the original PACER ratings that we did in 2014, that we are at 39% for our locals and 45 for our majors at, on 2014. So there's quite a ways to go by 2025. Um, now, how do we get there from where we were in 2014? Um, it involves really a key paradigm shift in how we maintain our roads and how we treat our roads. Um, what we'd been doing previously in the city before we started undertaking this pavement asset management program was um, basically to use a, uh, stealing a little bit from my colleague Crescent, um, uh, the, uh, the kind of the model of comparing our roads to a car. Um, when you go and buy a new car, typically you don't drive it off the lot and then uh, just ignore all the maintenance, don't change the oil, don't rotate the tires, and just wait till the engine seizes up and go buy a new car. You, you ch change the oil, you rotate the car, you do preventative maintenance on it. Um, it's the same thing with roads. Um, previously, and for maybe the 10 to 12 year period before, um, before 2014, we were really um, doing that, basically. Um, we were um, not really doing a lot of maintenance on our roads um, for various reasons. I, I'm not gonna say that I know what they all are, but um, the, uh, um, so what, we, what the idea of this pavement asset management model is, is that we, um, you know, we, we, uh, we need to be doing some of the terminology that's used in pavement asset managers, using the right, doing the right fix at the right time, and uh, you know having uh, an expanded mix of fixes. So expanding your toolbox, using different types of treatments, and using those treatments at the right time in the life cycle of the pavement, such that you're extending um, the life of existing pavements, not just waiting until they fall apart before you replace them. Um, previously, we had been doing things like filling potholes, but uh, on the other end, the only things we were doing was really resurfacing and reconstructing the pavements. Um, so that was not the, uh, that's not the optimal way to go about managing pavements. 
Um, so these intermediate fixed categories, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about in a second here, are what we call capital preventative maintenance. That's your, 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 your major preventative maintenance type projects and treatments. So what are those kinds of treatments? And we kind of call this the food chain of fixes. And as I go through this, I'm gonna start kind of at the bottom of the food chain, which are the cheapest treatments and the most basic treatments and move up to the most complex. Um, so right at the bottom, you've got your standard pothole repair. Um, any road that you build is eventually going to develop potholes in it. Um, and uh, that uh, potholes are caused by water getting under the pavement and freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing, which we get a lot here in Michigan, and eventually that forms a pavement failure in a pothole. Filling the pothole not only gives the, you know, it makes the driving experience on or riding experience on the road better, um, but uh, it also, you know, keeps that problem from exacerbating by covering it over and getting the, you know, keeping the water out. Um, as we talk about keeping the water out of the pavement, which is the cause of a lot of these problems, um, one of the next level treatments we can do is to is crack sealing. Now we pave a new road, after a few years, it's inevitably going to start to crack. That's just nature. Um, but doing crack sealing at the right time seals up those cracks, helps keep the water out of the pavement and extends the life of those pavements. So it's a very important step in the treatment process. The next thing up from that is some of our uh, surface sealing or surface, what we call surface treatments. And there's various different things that can be done that range from um, like a slurry seal that would go over the entire road that is kind of similar purpose of crack sealing is to seal up all the cracks and the, and the, and the the deficiencies in the pavement um, to keep the water out, but uh, you know it's you know you use this on a pavement that's a little bit further you know deteriorated than you know than something you would crack seal. Um, the other thing we can do as a surface treatment is something that uh, that's called a cape seal. Um, there's various different types of treatments, but I'm just touching on the ones that we would be using here in the city, um, where um, we put down a, um, a chip seal that's similar to what you see out in the counties, where they put on the loose you know a tar and a loose gravel down, um, but then we put another layer over the top of that to seal that in and that gives the road a little bit it seals it up but also gives it a little bit more structural uh you know um strength as well going up from that then we're um, talking into a little bit more of what you would see as a traditional paving project, um, a thin mill and fill, which is something we typically would use on some of our major roads that have a thicker pavement section where we're, you know, the surface course is just worn out and we take off maybe two inches or less and pave it back down. It's usually a pretty quick project uh, that we're in and out pretty quickly, not doing a lot of other ancillary work with that. That's actually what we're doing out on State Street right now, um, literally right now. Um, the next step up from that um, is what we call locally a resurfacing and typically what we refer to as resurfacing is where we're taking off all the asphalt and putting down new asphalt. Um, but that's typically um, kept within the existing curb lines. Um, we might patch some curb here and there. We'll do our, um, you know, make all of our, our sidewalk ramps ADA compliant and we might um, change out a few uh, um, storm drains and things like that, but it's mostly between the curbs type work. And then at the very top of the food chain, you've got your reconstruction projects. This is where you tear out everything and start from scratch. So um, the, uh, the, the benefit of doing that is that you have a, a clean palette to work from. And uh, this is where you can really make some major substantial changes to the road. Um, you can you know, narrow the road, you can change the curb lines. Um, usually we have utility replacement work that goes along with that. Um, so this is where we can um, really fully implement our complete streets policy and our green streets policy, which is this kind of the stormwater component of that. Um, the problem with that is this is massively more expensive than any of the other treatments that I talked about. So there's, there's trade offs there. Um, so as we're talking about, uh, talking about money and costs, um, I wanted to throw in a little bit about what, uh, what kind of budgets we have and what money we have to spend on, on road, uh, treatments. And, uh, they come from a variety of sources. The, the largest one is our street millage, um, or it, as it's actually currently called the street bridge and sidewalk millage. Um, in some form or another that's been around in the city since the early 80s. Um, and it's been renewed every five years since then. Um, and that brings in on average about uh, about $10 million a year for, for roads. Um, 
We also have sur surface transportation funds. That's um, kind of our share of the federal uh, money that comes in for roads. Um, it's on average about two million a year. It really depends because it's a project by project uh, basis for that kind of money. Um, and then uh, we also have our Act 51 money, which is the state gas tax, mo tax money. Um, about a million dollars of that a year is dedicated towards these types of projects, um, primarily in the capital preventative maintenance area. That's not all the Act 51 money that we get, but uh, the city uses their Act 51 money for a lot of other things, such as the routine maintenance. You got your snow plowing, your street sweeping, your pavement markings, signs and signals, all that kind of stuff also is funded from Act 51. But the million dollars is about what we're dedicating towards pavement asset management. So taking all of this information that we've gathered, um, we have an um, a asset management modeling uh, program that uh, Deb's gonna talk a little bit more about in just a second here. Um, but just wanted to show you kind of what, uh, um, this is kind of one of the data points that goes in where we kind of identify these different treatments and when in the pavement life cycle is an appropriate time to use that. Um, and then once we do that treatment, it kind of resets it up to a higher level. So. Um, all of this is input that goes into the model. And then at the far right, you can see those are costs, uh, those are costs per square yard, right, Deb? Um, those are average costs per square yard for that kind of treatment that goes into the model as well. And you, because you can see from that, when you go from the bottom to the top, it's almost 200 times more expensive to do reconstruction than it is to crack seal. Um, not that you would ever consider doing both of those on the same pavement anyway. But um, where you really hit your sweet spot is kind of in the middle um, in those treatments that are in the five to $10 per square yard range. That's that capital preventative maintenance type thing that I'm talking about. And that's where you really get your bang for the buck in those treatments. Um, and now I'm turning it back over to Deb. Thank you. Okay, so when we talk about having a model um, the particular program that we're using to create our models from is called RoadSoft. And just as we picked PASER ratings as our condition rating choice, uh, we picked RoadSoft because it is basically what MDOT wants us to use. Um, there is a traffic <coughs> uh, management council, TAMC, for the state, and the city is required to report out as part of our Act 51 reporting, um, what we did to our roads, you know, what kind of treatments, how many dollars, when things were open to traffic, and so on. If you don't choose RoadSoft, it's a lot of work to manually go in uh, to the state site. So RoadSoft has a pavement asset management modeling function, and that's what we chose to use. So we're gonna just briefly go through some of the models that we looked at. And in these, so green is good, blue is fair, red is poor. So the first model is a model we would never do, but it provides uh, the baseline. What if you just stopped spending money on your roads, what would happen? Obviously what you're seeing here, you start out with some good roads uh, in some middle of the pack and some bottom ones, but if you let mother nature take its course, then by the time we get to 2025, we'd have literally no good roads, uh, a small middle class, as I call them in the blue, and a lot of very poor roads. So that's really there just to illustrate that without money, bad things happen. The next thing that we took a look at is what if we just keep doing business as usual? where, um, as Nick said, we're spending most of our money on resurfacing and reconstruction, which were the highest two in that food chain of fixes, and you know did not introduce capital preventive maintenance and spent our roughly $13 million a year. You can see it's much better, but it's also the trend that council was pointing out. It seems like we're slowly losing our good roads and something needs to change. So certainly not as bleak as not spending money. Uh, the middle class or the blue area kind of levels out and so do the good, but not in a direction that you want. So then the program allows you to optimize how you spend your money and shows you what the results would be. And basically what that model is saying is, you've got this bucket of money, I want you to spend 
this many dollars on uh, crack sealing, this many dollars on uh, slurry sealing, this many dollars on reconstruction, and points you in the direction that will move you to getting as many roads in good shape as possible. So you could say, oh, good. That's it. We just follow the cookbook and life is good. But that doesn't quite work either <laughs> because then reality starts to intrude. So the other things that we have to look at is things like, you know, there are already committed road projects when we started this. You know, we were committed to the big fix on Stadium Boulevard. Uh, there were several things that the public was already expecting in the way of particular projects. So we programmed those in and said, oop, that came out of this bucket. Uh, then also, we have to coordinate with our utility projects. So even if we'd like to jump in on this road and the model says we've got the money to do it, if we don't have enough water funds to fix the, the water at the same time, we might end up waiting. So we have to adjust for the reality of looking at all of the city's assets and maximizing the use of funds, even though our main focus is on roads. The other thing which is actually uh, very much a reality right now is what is the local capacity of paving contractors to get work done? In other words, even if we had an infinite checkbook, which we don't, um, there's only so many contractors. And we're starting to see it more in utilities right now than in road projects, but we have to take into account the reality, like if it's said the first year in the optimum model that we should basically crack seal some insane amount uh, of pavement and we're like, that's just not feasible and we can't find anybody with the capacity to do it even if we wanted to. And then with some of these fixes that are new to Ann Arbor, like very shortly you're gonna see some of these kind of surface treatments begin to happen, there may be some pushback. You know, they're not as pretty they're not as absolutely smooth as a traditional resurfacing, so we also wanted to sort of ease into fixes that have not been seen in Ann Arbor in a while. And so what we did then is create what we call a locally optimized strategy where we're guided by the principles of that optimal or ideal model, but adjust to local conditions. And so with that, yeah, until you see them side by side, you won't see the difference. It's still going to get us headed uh, very much in the right direction, but it's just if we go and compare all these models, um, the ideal model says you'll get 76% of your roads in good condition are optimized, but localized model still is about 72%. Uh, on the bottom end, again, our goal is to increase the good, we know no matter what, there's always gonna be a percentage of poor. There's 300 miles of road, there's never gonna be enough to treat every mile every year. So uh, the guideline that we're using is that locally optimized model. And in theory, uh, you know, we will get uh, to uh, pretty much to that goal of 80%. The 72 is good, um, but we set good as seven and above and sixes are included in good inside the road soft model. There's not a lot we can do to tweak that. But basically, that model is guiding us as to the type of treatments, and we can pick which roads get them based on those triggers, like if it's a seven, it gets crack sealing, we have this many dollars of crack sealing, and here's our candidate streets. And we're also working to take a geographic approach. In other words, if we have this amount of money, and we do a bunch of work in this one area, we're gonna get the best bang for the buck and still be making uh, the particular types of treatments that the model is suggesting. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Nick to say, okay, that's how we started now. How is the path forward coming along? Okay, a few more slides here and then we'll be all done. Um, so uh, the from here, uh, what do we do from here on going forward? Um, and uh, um, so first of all, as Deb mentioned earlier, we're planning to obtain new PACER ratings every three years. Um, we might do the next one actually in two years, but, um, and uh, so we'll be checking in regularly to see, you know, collecting new data and see where we're at. Um, 
and then uh, based on those ratings, we'll assess, you know, how are these treatments doing? Are they working? Are we getting the bang for the buck that we are expecting to get from these treatments in the long run? And then, and use all of that to evaluate our global process towards that 10-year goal that we were, uh, that we were looking at. And then uh, make adjustments to the model as needed. If we're not on track, we can, you know, we can look at changing things. Maybe uh, one year we drastically reduce our normal street resurfacing program and put everything in towards to capital maintenance. Um, that would be somewhat extreme, but uh, you know, trying to to keep on path, uh, you know, those are some options that we might have. Um, so, uh, looking at uh, um, what's been going on since we started this in 2014 or in fiscal year 14, you can see how we've been slowly ramping up um, the uh, the capital preventative maintenance treatments and. This graph here shows the total number of miles of road treated. So with uh, using these capital preventive maintenance treatments, which is the orange on that graph, um, you can see how much more of it we've been doing. And because those are lower cost treatments, there's more miles of road we can treat with them. Um, the very last column is fiscal year 18, which we're in the fourth quarter of right now. And by the end of the quarter, um, being that we're finally out of the winter and into construction season again, we'll have a bunch more um, that that will probably rise up right around to the level of FY17. So how are we how are we doing from 14 to 17 um, with those two sets of data that we collected? Um, first of all, this uh, these graphs show major streets and kind of the groupings of rankings, and you can see in looking at our target category of those seven to tens, we're doing pretty well on major streets. We've gone up about four percent um, in that three-year span, um, which isn't bad. Um, however, on local streets, um, the the um, the picture isn't quite as good. Um, there's a variety of reasons for this I'll get into in a minute here. Um, but uh, as the data shows that it, that category actually dropped 10% over the first few years. So why is that and what are some of the challenges in treating local streets? Um, well, first of all, um, there's some of the funding um, sources that we have um, are somewhat challenging for local streets. Act 51, for example, the gas tax money we get from the state has a formula that is dictated to us in terms of how much we can spend on major streets. There's a percentage of major streets versus local streets, which I think is 75, 25 in favor, favor of major roads. Um, and the theory behind that is that, well, major roads get the more traffic, they're higher visibility, um, and therefore they get more of the state funding. Um, unfortunately, two thirds of our network is local streets. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, uh, um, as I showed in that previous, uh, or a few slides ago that we've, over the last three years, we've been ramping up into this new philosophy of pavement asset management. And so uh, um, we really, at this point, haven't gotten to those local streets on the on the uh, capital preventative maintenance type treatments. Um, we've done some crack sealing, but the crack sealing kind of keeps it at the same level and doesn't really raise it up. We have a bunch of work that's gonna be going on this spring, actually in the next few weeks on local streets um, where we're going to hit a bunch of that capital preventative maintenance. We finally got that pro project and program up and rolling. So um, that will make a big difference in the coming years as well. Um, and then, uh, um, and then finally, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> um, the, uh, well, the last thing I wanted to mention on those lines too was that uh, um, the, the way we collected our data, this actually isn't on the list, but uh, the way we collected our data, we actually collected under an old system that the city had been using for years called PAVER. Um, I know it's just one letter off from PACER, but it's uh, quite a different system for collecting the data. Um, and what we've done up to this point was we, we collected it the way we had collected it before under this old system and converted it to the new system. And what we've been finding is it seems to be uh, under-reporting the condition in many cases that we've seen. So um, the next time we do our data collection, we're gonna collect it directly through PAVER and hopefully get better um, you know, better uh, um, results that don't have to go through that conversion process. So um, we expect we're kind of in the, um, the dark before the dawn here with local streets in that there's going to be a lot of more uh, treatments coming up now that we have that capital preventative, and preventative maintenance program up and running. So with that, uh, open it up for questions.
Nick, at the, um, you know, this Transportation Commission is, you know, interested in a lot of things, right? Uh, really working on world-class biking facilities in this town. Pedestrian crossings are a big deal. Um, and, and you said the staff is recommending that the streets are at a seven, at least at a seven. Um, how does that compare with other cities, similar de demographics as, as Ann Arbor? Uh, I, I know you said it was a staff recommendation. Is that based on some comparison to other cities like this? Um, no, actually it was, what it was based on is looking at, um, as we ran through these model scenarios, we didn't show every single model scenario in here that we ran, we ran a lot of them. Um, and it was basically looking at what is within, you know, what is, what is the best we think we can do um, with the funding that we have. And then we set the goal right at the upper end of that bar, kind of rounding up to 80%. So. Um, I don't know of another municipality that has their goals set that high. Okay. Um, and it is a goal. Um, I mean, we're going to try as hard as we can to reach that goal. Well, so that's um, great then. I mean, it's a great answer because we want all these other great facilities too. Yeah. So. And I don't know, I, honestly, I don't know how many other municipalities have actually set a goal. Um, to tell you the truth. I, I've been to several pavement asset management conferences and it's not something I hear a lot about, is like, what is the goal? The goal is better roads. <laughs> so in my previous life, our goal was 80% of our roads in satisfactory or better condition. And it was the same kind of analysis. I think our bottom standard was a little lower. We talked about satisfactory instead of good. So what Nick's and Deb have present as a pretty aggressive category. Uh, better roads mean better bike facilities as well. Be interesting to see what happens with the different pavement treatments and the public acceptance this coming construction season. One of the things I'll say just to add on to that is uh, I, I mentioned really quickly the, the Cape Seal treatment and we're really just about to do a few of those around town. So um, just to give you a heads up, um, one of the things you're going to see um, or may see if you happen to be in the right area is uh, um, the, I mentioned the, the first step of a Cape Seal is a chip seal, which is that, that tar and the, and the stones that you'll see in rural areas a lot. Um, that's the first step. That's there for a couple of days, a um, few days maybe, and then the other layer goes on top of that. So I imagine we're going to hear a lot from the public in those few days before the, before the final treatment goes on top of it. Um, I know we've already heard from the bicycle, bicycling community on that topic about, uh, you know, well, I heard we we're gonna be doing chip seals and things like that. It's really a step in the process. So if you start hearing things like that, it's, you know, it, that's not the final surface. So, so I, I have one comment, which is that I think one of the major criticisms we hear of any innovative project that we're doing is fix the roads first. And so the, the difficulty in communicating and, and educating the general public about how the roads are being fixed, what the standards are they're looking at, uh, continues to be a huge challenge. And I would certainly would just encourage you to do all that you can to communicate and educate and let people know what is happening um, because that perception really does stand in the way of um, everything else that we want to do mm -hmm. uh, in, in getting support, including especially pedestrian and bicycle safety yeah. and all the innovative stuff. Um, so it, it is critical for, for the safety of everyone. And I certainly had some bad experiences bicycling recently uh, this weekend, losing possessions out of my bike because I hit so many potholes. Um, but uh, we, we need to let people know what is actively being done. And, yeah. and I don't envy you your position at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, we, we are, um, in terms of talking about this type, these types of treatments and things like that, we're putting, we are putting together an informational flyer right now, um, and we'll have a web page on that um, to help, um, you know, get the word about, out about what we're doing. Um, it's hard to get, it's hard to get this whole concept into a quick sound bite that people can digest, though. So a lot of it is really um, person by person, 
as they as they contact us and ask questions. But we're trying to get as much information out proactively as we can in a digestible manner. So we can all summarize this on next door for you. And there you go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for uh, presenting this. It, it's really interesting to think about all the different, um, you know, uh, parameters that had to be thought of. Um, you know, like you said, there's an ideal scenario, and then there's real world, and there's some very real world constraints. Um, you know, even like you said, even if you did have infinite money, you don't have infinite other resources. Um, you know, one thing you said, Nick, uh, caught my ear, which was the idea of how much is um, federally funded for major versus local roads. And I guess I was wondering what that, you know, I, I, like, I, I certainly trust uh, what you're saying about the next year or two being really fundamental and seeing a difference in that. What I'm kind of thinking a lot about is looking at the 10 year um, timeline, you know, that's not really broken out by major and local roads. And I guess I'm wondering, uh, the fixes are kind of the same cost. <coughs> whether it's a major or a local road, I believe. But the question of sort of how many, I guess, I guess, I guess it's really more represented in the number of miles that are um, tackled each year. Um, the more miles that are tackled, as a, as a rule of thumb, it's probably true that there are more local roads tackled as well. Um, and I guess the model is a way of, uh, you know, addressing more miles overall, which means more local roads. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I would say that's accurate. Um, you know, that, that uh, um, those graphs that I showed is um, with the miles of road treated is, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's really just instructional for showing how much more we're getting. Yeah, it's not broken down by major or local, but uh, um, one of the things that uh, when, you, when you said that, um, you know, kind of popped in my head that I kind of skipped over in my presentation was, you know, one of the ways that we're trying to address that, you know, kind of funding gap between majors and locals is, you know, we, we have flexibility, we have less flexibility in some funds and more flexibility in others. So with our own city street millage, for example, there's no such restrictions on that. So we can, you know, do more of our local street work through that and do more of our major street work through funding sources like the Act 51, the gas tax money, um, and the, the county road millage, for example, which I didn't really touch on here either. So those are those other two funding sources are ones that are more constrained towards major roads. Right. Um, and uh, so we have that flexibility and, and we're we're in it we're lucky that we're in a position to have that flexibility. A lot of other communities don't. Yeah and the fact um, that, that that I mean if I recall correctly, that was also the biggest bucket, right? The, yes. Um, yes. So that's so that the, so the, that is uh, <coughs> we're we're thinking more carefully about where we fund different road projects from. So that'll 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 help to ease that problem. It's also important to remember your major roads tend to be wider. Yeah. So that yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, and the amount of work that's done tends to balance itself out because you're paying attention to four or five lanes instead of two. Right, yeah, so when you look at just miles treated, it's, uh, it, it can be a little bit misleading because a mile of major road, a mile of four lane road is obviously a lot more expensive to treat than a mile of two lane road. Right. There's other ways to there's other ways to explain that we use a term called lane miles, yeah. which, um, which accounts for that, but people don't understand what that means all the time, so. <laughs> So we're over time on this by about 10 minutes, but if there's anything else that anybody wants to say quickly? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to, to keep taking time, and I'm, I'm going on a little tangent too, so I'll apologize a, a second time. But um, I just, one I wanted to first say, I really appreciate that we take the complete streets approach when we are going full on reconstruction and really taking a detailed look at how we can reconfigure the street in a fundamental way to achieve our, our safety goals, and, and I appreciate that. Um, and my question is, um, and this might be a question for beyond this, com beyond this conversation, is, is when we get to the point where we're doing work on the road where we're go going to have to restripe the road, even if we're not changing, you know, we're just doing curb to curb and we're not reconfiguring it, do we have processes or could we have processes to really think about at that time, like if we want to change the configuration of the road using paint or other things, mm -hmm. um, even if we're not 
reconstructing the whole thing. Yeah, yeah we absolutely yeah. do that. And, and uh, um, you know, a few months ago, uh, one of my colleagues, Dave Dykeman, was here to talk about our resurfacing program for this year and what we're doing on some of the streets that we are resurfacing. Um, and so, yes, there's an opportunity to, to do that. Where, and we've been doing that for years in terms of where we can reconfigure streets with paint. Um, we've been doing it for many years in the process of trying to add bike lanes, for example. Um, we come in, we resurface the street. Heck, if you even do a surface treatment, you're, you still have to put down the stripes after you're done. So the, those, yeah, there's opportunities to do that. You know, there's, you know, when I, when I say a reconstruction is the opportunity, it's not the only opportunity, it's the best opportunity to really change the environment of the street, you know, fundamentally. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of other opportunities on those other type projects as well. All right, yeah. I just want to make a comment sort of related to what Linda Diane said was, in the presentation, you implied that the only reason things are kind of out of whack is because if we're only sealing cracks, we can't go from pretty good to good. But the fact of the matter is you presented 43% poor, one to three. I mean, that's bad, mm -hmm. right? And it's worse than it was before. It's not like, well, we were bad, so we stayed bad. We were like, not so good, and we got even worse. So I don't think that's quite like a honest assessment of the situation. And I do think because people are aware of that situation, they are you know, f having all these negative feelings about the roads and the government and what are we doing with our money. And I think that the city needs to do more to advertise that they are taking this on, like some flyers and go to our website, the average person's not gonna do that. The average person's gonna drive down the road and curse your name, but they don't know your name because they don't go to the website because that's not what they're doing, <laughs> right? They're just like yeah. shaking their fist at the government in general mm -hmm. and they're complaining about it on next door. I think the police do a pretty good job of, you know, they have, um, statements, public statements on next door. People are having all these online discussions. I would advocate for the city to participate in that process, you know, in a proactive way. To say like, in, in, in really positive terms, hey guys, guess what? We're gonna fix the roads, you know? Like find somebody in the organization who is socially media savvy and would participate in next door and Facebook and Ann Arbor townies, you know? and these groups that so many people are on and try to put some positivity out there to overcome what is a pretty bad mood right now. Good point, thank you. Anything else urgent? All right, thank you for the update. Thank you so much. We gave Eli 10 minutes to talk about South State Street. Since they went 10 minutes over, I'm done. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you. If that's what you'd like. Actually, good evening. And for the folks at home, my name is Eli Cooper. I'm the city's transportation <laughs> program manager as well as a member of the commission. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to present the South State Street transportation study. Uh, which was a follow-up study to the city planning department's uh, vision for South State Street uh, that was completed several years ago, talked about land use, infill development, bringing development closer to the roadway. And during that process, uh, the needs for the street itself uh, were identified as a priority, and uh, we initiated a planning process in order to create uh, from what I would describe as a 1960s, 1970s era auto-centric environment to something that's much more akin to a 21st century complete street. And so I'll share with you uh, the process. Okay, here we go. Uh, got it. <laughs> Too many buttons to push. Uh, talk about uh, the alternatives that we considered as we looked at converting this uh, transportation corridor, uh, the recommended plan, and our next steps. 
So I think it's important to point out that uh, although there was a vision for the land use, uh, in the transportation planning process we outlined goals that were more directly related to the transportation system. Among those goals is to support the plan land use. You can see that as the seventh goal, the second one up from the bottom. But things like safety, pedestrian, bicycle, uh, access and transit were all important areas uh, that uh, were outlined uh, by the project team. We went through public meeting processes and these were uh, validated in, in the process. We use these goals to evaluate a series of various alternatives that we looked at. So when you look at a, a roadway corridor, say, gee, what could we do? Could we make it wider? Could we make it narrower? Uh, what about, um, and again, this work was underway about three, four years ago when we started. Roundabouts were uh, a neat new idea at the time, really an efficient way to move traffic, much safer. Uh, what would South State Street look like if we put a series of roundabouts instead of intersections? Uh, these areas were all evaluated during uh, the planning process. Uh, the first was, uh, of the three alternatives, was to look at a narrow median. Uh, kind of uh, skinny down the street, have direct left turns, uh, allow for plantable uh, median. One of the big comments that came in out of the planning study was the desire to treat uh, South State Street, particularly around 94, as a gateway and to, to green it up because it's pretty stark and bleak as you come into town today. And so even in a narrow median with direct left turns, the idea was to create uh, plantable spaces. Mentioned in the broader overview roundabouts, question of what would the corridor look like if we had a narrow median space that could be complemented with roundabouts to facilitate traffic movement uh, at those key junctions where intersections and driveways and side streets come in. Uh, so we uh, had that modeled and, and took a good look at that as well. Third alternative was uh, something that would eliminate the direct left turns by creating a wider median. Uh, we call them Michigan lefts. Uh, throughout the country they call them indirect lefts. Uh, but the opportunity for uh, the through traffic to continue uh, in the north or southbound direction but using a wide enough median so that turning traffic could make its turn within the median, creating even a larger footprint for green space along the corridor. Uh, we looked at all three of these uh, scenarios in great detail and contrasted and compared them across the eight goals. So as you look at uh, the scoring sheet, what you'll see across the top uh, are symbols that illustrate the goals that were outlined earlier. Uh, on the left, you'll see the three alternatives. And, uh, you know, as all of our report cards back in school, you get a red grade, that's not good. So when you look at the, um, the middle uh, one with uh, the roundabouts, you'll see uh, negative uh, responses both to uh, the vehicle traffic and to transit. And uh, the reason that got red was when we did the complex um, traffic modeling, what we found out was given the patterns of arrivals of vehicles at these proposed roundabouts, they would just gridlock. There, a lot of folks really w felt that roundabouts were going to be a great solution, but you need to have certain directionality in travel in order for it to work. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, if one of the interest is to maintain some level of mobility along the corridor, we saw that this weighed less than uh, the others. And you could see the, uh, the green with the pluses, those were uh, the positive characteristics, red being negative, and then the uh, this straight bar across uh, being neutral. So there was a clear loser, there wasn't a clear winner. And in true planner and Ann Arbor fashion, we decided to take the best of both worlds and came up with a hybrid recommended plan that would rely on a narrow median south of 94, uh, but would uh, enable or would, re re would call out a plan for a wider median between 94 uh, and Eisenhower. Uh, there was no question, uh, since we were going to a complete streets type design, that we were gonna accommodate buffered bicycle lanes, 
the length of the entire corridor, and so those are in the scenario, as well as continuous sidewalks that currently are not in place. Uh, another uh, key feature that was really uh, brought home to the city of Ann Arbor first in the 07 non-motorized plan reinforced by the Pedestrian Safety and Asset Access Task Force is it's not merely good enough to have sidewalks along the street, but that the opportunity for pedestrian crossings are equally fundamental to creating a complete street uh, that works. And so what you'll see as I go into the next slides, uh, not only do we have the sidewalks, but we have increased the number of uh, controlled pedestrian crossings to enable, uh, as the land use uh, goes through a metamorphosis over time and more activity comes closer to the roadway corridor, folks are going to be wanting to walk back and forth. If you're in a hotel on the east side, you want to go to an eatery on the west side, which actually happens today, uh, there's no way to get there. We actually um, had uh, some of our meetings along the corridor and talked to people who were staying in the hotels, and they said, well, I just play Frogger and, and, and hope I can get across. And that's not a Vision Zero community. That's not a pedestrian-friendly community, and this plan provides the components to allow for those to be provided over time. Another key attribute uh, when we think about Vision Zero, when we think about this corridor, is for those folks who are coming and going from uh, the city and they're using the interstate, uh, the ramps have this peculiar process where you get to cross halfway into the median and then you have to look way over your shoulder to see if you can merge into traffic. That's patently unsafe design. Uh, that might have worked back in the 1950s when the south part of Ann Arbor was uh, more, uh, I'll use this, the term even though it's a city, more rural uh, in the land use out there before Briarwood. Uh, but in a contemporary urban environment, it's just a recipe for disaster. And you'll see some uh, crash reduction <coughs> factors that we already have crash history out there and the design where the intersections with the interstate ramps are teed up and signalized creates better opportunities for all users. Bikes and peds will have uh, more crossings, they'll have controlled crossings of the freeway ramps, as well as the motorists will have predictability as to when it's time to go. You're going to be able to go and continue, not go, stop, and hope you don't wind up in a crash. Uh, so uh, in looking at the recommended plan improvements, you can see uh, the no build of where we are now, uh, no bike lanes and sidewalks compared to uh, absolutely two pedestrian crossing points today, eight in the future. A uh, number of left turns that can be made uh, the, into the median as I described, and you can see the A2 B safe logo because it really is a safety concern. There's six of those today. They're not only at the freeway ramps, they're also as you exit uh, and enter the mall. Uh, so uh, those are gonna be eliminated. Um, another area uh, that we heard complaints about is if you come out of some of the side streets, you, can't, you can see across the way, but you can't even drive there. Uh, you have to go way out of your way, go north, turn around, come back. Uh, there's a number of limited, uh, what are called left turn. Uh, only 50% of turns can be made with the current design. We'll get to 92% once this design is put in place. Uh, the paved area is turned into landscaped area. Uh, the overall trade-off, and I'll use that expression because I, uh, I think it is a trade-off. In order to introduce more crossing, in order to create a complete street, in order to have traffic travel at a speed that's consistent with human interaction along the corridor, you'll note that it might take a motorist a minute or two to go the greater than one mile distance from uh, Eisenhower down to Ellsworth uh, during the peak period. and. Uh, through this process, that's a trade-off that is, uh, it is, if you will, planned into the process. That traffic will be slowed as a result of uh, increasing the number of crosswalks, increasing the number of signals, uh, but the benefits for the human, for people who use it, is all positive. The safety, again, uh, trying to keep within my 10 minutes, uh, you can see, the five-year crash numbers on the left of the chart, 
And on the right, you can see the estimated crash reduction factors of 90%. That means basically they're being eliminated. And again, the, when you start to look at the numbers of crashes and eliminating them, and if you, if you look at the high crash locations within the city, the State Street corridor does show up on the high locations. This will get it off the list, uh, as well as accommodate uh, all travelers uh, efficiently and safely. Um, I know Nick was talking about the pavement uh, management program and the resources available for that. Uh, this cost estimate is not all city costs. The total cost for uh, the entire project is about $30 million. Uh, approximately 10 million of those would be MDOT dollars because the bridge over 94 is an MDOT facility. Uh, we're uh, coordinating with MDOT right now. They're doing a safety study of the 94 corridor. Uh, maybe we can use our plan. We already have sent them the copy of this uh, so that it can integrate the ramp changes and the bridge deck alterations as part of the current planning for the I-94 corridor improvements. And that's what we tend to do here within the city is we're, uh, we do our planning to uh, articulate what it is so everyone knows the direction we're heading. And then when funding opportunities, whether it's our own funds or other agencies or federal grant programs become available, uh, we are prepared to submit our projects. And so I don't have a specific uh, timeline uh, for uh, these, but these cost estimates are uh, valid at this level of analysis for a plan. Uh, it's not inexpensive, but it's a wholesale change of a very important uh, transportation element within our community. Uh, the next steps, uh, and you might remember Deb, uh, one of her early presentations to you was the whole CIP process. Uh, this uh, late this summer, we're going to be starting up a new CIP, and I'm pleased to report that when I go to the first meetings for the CIP, I've now got a detailed set of plan with projects that will be incorporated into the CIP program. They will be prioritized, ranked, rated, and placed based on how they score. Uh, so that's one of the next steps is the whole CIP process. We're also going to be, as we typically do, uh, be very ambitious in securing uh, federal and state funds as they become uh, known and available. Safety funds, uh, road, um, you know, complete streets funds, uh, Vision Zero funds. There's a variety of funds that uh, we can't even describe what they might be going forward. It used to be Tiger, now they're Build. Uh, but having a project plan uh, and something that uh, was called shovel ready back in the early uh, part of the 21st century. We're gonna be in that position. Uh, as the funding is allocated to these projects, it'll be incorporated into the TIP. And then ultimately we will take these uh, conceptual drawings and uh, traffic model and recommendations into what will ultimately become a final design and construction project. Thank you, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. I appreciate all the work that goes into this, especially with uh, Commissioner Trudeau and I serving on planning commission. This is a great compliment. Um, you know, I, I think two corridors that, that are slated for a lot of change, Washtenaw and State Street. Um, with Washtenaw, we're considering the Reimagine Washtenaw initiative. We're considering the introduction of medians and left turns, which is a huge departure from the norm as it exists today. And here on the State Street Corridor, we're looking at taking a step back away, not a full step away from, from medians and, and Michigan lefts, but a step back. Can you kind of try to highlight why, um, I guess the similarities and differences of the, the approaches? Yeah. One of the issues or opportunities with regard to Washtenaw is it connects the two important downtowns, Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, and there's an acknowledgement within the Reimagine Washtenaw for desire of future high capacity transit that might run through a median. So there was care and attention paid to creating a median during, uh, through the length of that project uh, as that initial planning had been conducted. In this project, recognizing not that the world begins and ends at 94, but that from 94 north, uh, where we currently have the width, the idea is to take the opportunity and turn that into a more attractive green streets type of, uh, you know, stormwater management accommodating uh, area and uh, use that. But there was no necessity to anticipate 
a continuous high capacity corridor continuing down south to what are more uh, suburban land uses outside of the city. Uh, so that I think that's a key dr and dramatic difference between Washtenaw and its role as facilitating and accommodating economic exchange between the city of Ypsilanti and the city of Ann Arbor and the way that the State Street Corridor operates both now and how it's anticipated to operate uh, with uh, the, uh, planning vision as I understand it. The questions, comments. Okay. I imagine you know I'm going to comment on it, Eli. Uh, uh, thank you for the work that you do. I know Cynthia and, and you do a lot of work that I, I very much appreciate it. And uh, I, I know you both work within constraints, right? That that uh, exist. And one of those constraints, I think, is I-94. And I'm very worried about just that segment. I think I, I, I like everything else, but we have uh, three uncontrolled merge situations similar to what's at Ann Arbor Saline Road heading south right now. Uh, I find that a very difficult section and I'm an avid cyclist and has ridden everywhere. Uh, I showed the diagram to my wife and she said that looks terrifying and I admit I will not take Jackson on that. Uh, so. I'm very concerned, uh, and it sounds like from the public comments that I read, others were concerned about bicycle and pedestrian safety at, at this section. So I'm wondering if there were other alternatives that were looked at, including asking MDOT to signalize and 90 degree all ramps, if that's even feasible. Uh, that's what the plan is. The, the all ramps on ramps? Yes. Mm -hmm. what, can you go back to that slide? I will try. Technology doesn't <laughs> fail me. And it might or might not be easy to see, but you can see, I would think you can see the uh, traffic signals that are being added. Uh, on this one, it would be on the right side. And on this one, it would be on the left side. And you can see where it says modified operation and there's a symbol of a traffic signal so the ramps are being teed up and that enables for those current left turns to be eliminated so but there's still there's still essentially an on-ramp to the right of a cyclist going 35 and the straight through crossing going 35 it's impossible for this to show that, um, okay. but I believe with the ramps being teed up that those slip ramps that would be the term, uh, would be a, a level of detail that would be factored in given the design of the, uh, the, the bridge deck at that time. What I, so, so I, I can't say definitively that, you know, with the information I have, uh, but the intent is to, at least for those uh, cyclists and pedestrians who are interacting with the traffic exiting the ramps, that they're going to be teed up, they're going to be signalized, and uh, you know there's there's going to be that natural flow of traffic, if you will, that if the ramps are red, shutting down the main line, that's going to create some um, respite. I'm not going to yeah. say relief, but some opportunity for. Uh, folks who are traveling north and south along the corridor, even if the um, the slip ramps remain. And, and my suspicion is that the design probably still includes slip ramps because the width is already on the structures for that. But I, I, I will research that and I will send you an email tomorrow. Great. Thanks, Eli. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much, Eli. One uh, additional comment, because I did take the opportunity to look at the ordinance language uh, oh. that came up in the early question. There is no specific language that differentiates the two-lane cross-section versus multiple lane, uh, but I reminded myself that the language that says approaching, once you step into a two-lane roadway that's 20 feet, you're already approaching the center line by you know what I would call logic and reason. So the answer I gave earlier with regard to if a pedestrian's in a crosswalk walking across a two-lane road, that constitutes a stop in both direction. 
multi-lane, the operating language says that it's only the half of the roadway that includes the uh, pedestrian within it. Uh, and again, for folks at home, what that should mean to you is if you're driving across uh, a pedestrian crosswalk on a four lane road, and if the pedestrian's like way over there on the sidewalk or in the right lane, uh, legally you have the right to continue to proceed. But as they approach that center line, which means once they get into the lane that's next to the center line, then that does constitute a stop. And I would think that would uh, the commission might benefit from the attorney describing in a legal sense how that is implemented. Uh, but I think the general practical sense is that if there's somebody within 10 feet of that line and they're moving towards it, that uh, the, the prudent course of action is stop. That's what our rule is, allow the pedestrian the right of way as they're entitled to, to properly and safely cross the street. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, we have some transportation updates that we can highlight, I hope. I will do my brief cliff notes and then even go through all the changes. So just a couple quickly to point out to the commission. Um, couple of projects, I'm actually gonna go right past construction because that pretty minor updates there. But under projects currently in design plan, you wanna call out particular opportunities for community engagement. So the commission should certainly take advantage of those if you're interested and able. So uh, the Nixon Road corridor uh, item has some updates on that where that engagement uh, process will be starting soon, uh, late May, early June. And so we'll make sure you folks are informed of that as well as uh, in the section titled the People Friendly Streets Initiative, which was the projects the DDA presented uh, to the commission earlier. Uh, another opportunity on uh, those projects, uh, the charrette uh, type uh, forums that were held uh, about a month or so ago, they're gonna be coming back and doing those as that design uh, further evolves. So that is currently scheduled the week of June 4th. Uh, so uh, afford yourselves those opportunities if you're able and, and interested. Um, a couple of new items that have been added, brand new, just uh, also for the <coughs> folks at home. Uh, some specific projects uh, that replaced a section we had on the safety grants. So we heard about the Fuller Road sidewalk extension tonight, but we also have a specific uh, write-up on the Ann Arbor Steam Safe Routes to School project. So that's, that's a new add. And back to the DDA, uh, an item that we've added uh, from them on downtown bicycle parking. I know that was uh, an item discussed by the commission a few months ago and along uh, with Commissioner Trudeau going back to the Planning Commission. And also just in general, hopping around a bit, but we've added more links in this report. So this is also an added resource. So uh, for example, Eli's presentation just gave the final report for the State Street Corridor. There's an actual link in the document that you can click on and take you to that document or web page. Uh, throughout the, the report, so please uh, use that uh, as possible. And um, I guess the um, two last items I'll mention briefly uh, toward the end. Uh, the very last one I'll mention, the quiet zone, train horn noise, mentioned that I believe last meeting, that did go to City Council Monday night and was approved, so uh, we have a contract and funding to undertake that study, which will be a preliminary uh, high-level examination to see what would it take to uh, initiate and get established a quiet zone for the railroad corridor through uh, the city. So we'll certainly keep you folks posted on that and those opportunities to participate as well. And uh, also just a quick update that the transportation plan update, uh, the major uh, project uh, certainly for Commissioner Cooper, uh, I call him Eli in our group, uh, but also for the commission to get that out and updated. The RFP uh, proposals uh, are in, being reviewed by a, a staff committee, and so certainly be more updates on that along the way, but that's, that's going forward as well. And so the only other item since it was, and it ties into that item, uh, was under the staff report and updates and has been mentioned a couple of times, and Eli certainly hit on it, uh, particularly with the State Street uh, study, but the Vision Zero Implementation FOB had some questions, particularly from uh, Commissioner Parsons and other discussions. So that was just an, another added item uh, in the uh, submittal and the agenda uh, response to those questions. And really, I'll keep it at the highest level. 
Uh, but if there's questions the uh, commission may have, I'll probably turn to Eli for, for detail. But again, key part is with that transportation plan update, that's going to be going forward a full modal looking at the entire uh, transportation system with the city, but within the context of the Vision Zero and really using that effort to uh, get the data, get the information, and really understand within the context of Ann Arbor what is Vision Zero, what does it mean for us, and move us forward to uh, really achieve that. So with that, I'll see if there's any questions on projects in the report or the Vision Zero items for me. I have one question um, on the South 7th or on the 7th Street improvements. It seemed to me like it used to say that we would go all the way to Miller, and now it says just to Huron for the resurfacing and for the uh, buffered bike lanes. Actually, it's Am a good I thing Nick's here tonight. wrong I about we that? Originally. Um, the, I, I, you know, I honestly don't recall um, where the, off the top of my head right now, where the buffered bike lanes end. Um, the resurfacing part of it is actually only going to be between Stadium and Sio Church. Um, I'll have to check on the buffered bike lanes. Well, Cynthia might know. You know, Cynthia? Eli? I recall that the area in front of West Park has uh, on-street parking and there's uh, no yes. bike lanes. Yes. So that's a shared road segment. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, do, I don't believe North 7th was included in that. Okay. And no improvements to the pavement either direction? No, it's just the, uh, um, what we're doing right now is uh, we're doing a thin mill and fill on that section between Stadium and Sio Church, which is easily the okay. section that needs it the most, I think. Just mention that it, it's quite dangerous in the bike lane area, both going downhill and uphill on 7th okay. uh, from Huron and to Huron. Okay. Any other comments or questions about the updates? A uh, couple, couple questions, or, or uh, one is, can, can you make sure that you keep us in the loop with the, the north side scene? Uh, I know a lot of us are interested in, in how that goes, and we might ask the CIP committee if they might want to look at that, if that's feasible. Um, I think that's setting the basis for how we're going to treat a lot of schools, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I, I, personally, I'd like to, to be in on that discussion. And then the other is the, the thank you, Eli, for the long uh, Vision Zero statement. Um, and I think maybe you, we can just get together and talk. Uh, the the principles uh, are spot on, right? Uh, traffic deaths and severe injuries are preventable, therefore not acceptable. Human life and health are prioritized. People will make mistakes, uh, and the transportation should be designed so those mistakes aren't fatal. Transportation safety solution must be addressed on a system level, and most important, speed is recognized and prioritized as the fundamental factor in crash severity. I agree to all of those as a, a working definition of, of Vision Zero principles and how engineering can look at areas. What I'm wondering is why uh, Sio Church didn't really get a vision. It got a complete streets treatment, but not really a vision zero treatment. Uh, Pauline originally was going to have zero treatment. It was just going to go in as it was. Um, I'm, I'm wondering where that disconnect is. Um, I think as the design process and here I'm trying to straddle between Nick and his folks who do in the design and, and Eli and, and the transportation planning world. So I'll, I'll do my best and I'll ask Eli and Nick to correct me what if I, if I step too far aside. But I think as um, both our uh, design folks and the people implementing the projects uh, learn and take into account the multiple on the various aspects. It's, it's an area that uh, certainly the awareness is raised and increasing, and it's a learning curve even, even for staff, too. So I think these opportunities that the commission's providing, both to us and, and through to those actual line staff, the people doing the designs, overseeing the designs with consultants and others, it's uh, a process that certainly is going to evolve and um, can't 
guarantee or even predict we're going to hit it all the time for sure. And that's where yeah. this uh, approach and you folks uh, participating in is helping to improve that uh, along the way. So I'm not sure that's too general of an answer. That's actually that, the perfect. That's a, I think that's a great answer, and that's what I'm excited to hear. I just think that these specific memorandums that have been going to council haven't been aspirational or even moving forward toward. It has been a descriptor of what is happening, i.e., yeah, we got things covered. Where, you know what I mean? Instead of saying, like, yes, we're working toward uh, some vision zero mm -hmm. principles that are going to guide us. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm cool with that. I'm cool working, and I hope to, to do more. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Oh. Anything else quickly? All right. Oh, Stephanie. Can you just clarify? I got confused because the document said from 7th Street changes from, the document says from Huron to Sion Church, and I thought he said stadium. The, and I'll let Nick correct me. Let's see if, see if I hit this. That from stadium to Sion Church is an actual, and even back to the pavement asset management, the thin mill and fill, so that's going to be kind of the most pavement work where they're literally taking it down from Stadium North to Huron. Uh, they're not going to be doing that mill and fill. The pavement itself is another condition. So that's more, is that getting a surface treatment or just the restriping? We're, we're only treating the inside of the church. Oh. Okay. So <laughs> north, north is in the north project, but that's just adding the buffered bike, bike, bike lanes. Will oh, there still be the buffered bike lanes? Yes, that's st that's still part of the project. But actually, back to Commissioner Trudeau's, we're modifying it through the paint, if you will, uh -huh. rather than even on the pavement that's there. Uh -huh. But from Stadium to South Church, that's going to be more involved with the actual pavement because of the uh, yeah, far far the severe pavement. condition. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's way past. Yes. All right. Uh, just. One more thing, I noticed the Washtenaw Pittsfield crosswalk that uh, it was uh, essentially delayed because they're still waiting on a, uh, a transportation work authorization and something like they could do, they would be able to do that this summer hopefully and then said something about fiscal year 19. Uh, well, what's the, I'm assuming the state's fiscal year, what is that? That's correct. So this, yeah, and I don't you know, keep when you talk fiscal of years, yeah, and when you've got multiple fiscal years, the, the state's fiscal year begins in September, and so their fiscal year 19, pause for a second, uh, begins October 1st. So what oh, they're so October 1st of 2018. Of 2018 is the beginning of their fiscal year. So as a practical matter in construction, and I'd probably look to Eli perhaps again as the one most in contact, but I interpret that as uh, for construction, most likely being next spring, but that they're doing the design work and the things they need to do now here this spring and summer to get that into their uh, process uh, for that, that time frame. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. A lot of stuff going on. Um, so we'll move into liaison reports from those who are representing other agencies, commissions, or groups. Anything to report? All right, any reports from commissioners? Yeah, well, I attended the RTA uh, meeting. They had a like a public feedback meeting in Ann Arbor last week. I sent it to uh, Kayla, but somehow the message got, didn't get seen until uh, after the meeting. I hope people were aware of that meeting anyway, and you can still send feedback to, the, to them via the website, and there's also a survey on there. But uh, yeah, so asked a few questions. There's a few bus routes that it would plan to come into Washtenaw County. It looks like the two that come into Ann Arbor would both be commuter express. And as far as they're currently planning would be unidirectional, meaning they would only take commuters into Ann Arbor and then out. They would not like provide a connection from Ann Arbor to like Livonia or any of those areas, but there is one bus that would provide the connection to Livonia and Canton and that would go through Ypsilanti. But I did express a little concern that they should have a direct connection from Ann Arbor. The, there was also the commuter rail, which uh, was supposed to be eight times a day. And 
Yeah, I expressed uh, perhaps have some off-peak bus service in there, but uh, yeah, so feel free to express your own concerns about the plan and everything. I know they're, they went through several meetings and then they come back to the board, which, yeah, that's a big question mark. And there's also some pending legislation at the state level to allow opt-outs for the RTA. <laughs> And, uh, well, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Any other commission? Yes. Uh, I was asked uh, through an email to comment a little bit on the driver behavior study. Um, I did mention this was, we're starting again on April, I'm sorry, May 29th, to run through June 8th. There'll be 16 uh, two-hour enforcement shifts. Um, we got a lot of questions through our Next Door app that uh, one of our civilian staff operates about the study and why the signs weren't updated and things like that. So we've been responding to a lot of those uh, questions, giving updates to the neighborhood groups. Uh, and then also about the uh, fatality on uh, Miller that uh, occurred last month. Uh, the report's still not complete. We haven't finished our investigation on that. Um, some things I can mention that I think we're already in MLive. Um, the pedestrian that was struck was not uh, walking in the crosswalk. Uh, she was walking her dog. Uh, which was not injured in the collision. Uh, there's no uh, substance abuse on the part of the driver, no distracted driving, and no um, speeding issues that uh, we've discovered so far. And when we're, hopefully, uh, we'll be done with that soon. Uh, when we are, it'll be submitted to the county prosecutor for review. Thanks for that. Any other commissioner communication? All right, then it's a call for our next uh, for agenda items for next meeting or future meetings. Anything to add to the work plan or? I want to make sure we have an agenda item for discussing the wording of the ordinance. Thank you. I made note of that for crosswalk ordinance language discussion, including a city attorney. Probably it sounded like. I was also wondering how it proceeds with replacing my position because it appears they didn't confirm the suggested replacement yet. I wasn't sure what's happening with that. Uh, I can reach out to the mayor's office and try to get an update together. I don't have any further information. I understood an application had been submitted and they were gonna take that name forward to city council. It's the last, I, um, last update I had, but I'll follow up. Because I, I can, do feel- I can follow up as well. Yeah, I do feel it's important that the position is replaced with an A2 safe transport person because of their participation and dedication in this arena. So I was just concerned if something other than that was being considered. Thanks. Okay. Any other agenda items which you can also think of later on and let us know? I'll just give a heads up of what's on the work plan um, for the June 20th meeting, the capital improvements plan. So we'll have Deb Goslin back to discuss capital improvements with us at June 20th and Amber Miller from the DDA to talk about First Ashley and Williams Street. And we're also planning to roll out the traffic calming program update at that meeting or in initiate that discussion. So um, if we're able to pull together all of those items, it's gonna be a full agenda. So plan on um, a lot to cover on June 20th. Great, so if there are no objections, I'll call the meeting adjourned. No the gavel's gavel. missing. <laughs> Thank you.